I am a humble man. That you feel you don't belong. I won't say you should follow me. You are welcome. You are loved. Join us. And we shall reach the promised plane. I'm not boastful. And my chorus is more soulful. One of joy. We can't see. One lacking pain. What you we are. Doing. The cult of the heart. seems to be us. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is another episode of the Cult of Odd, and I am your friendly neighborhood cult leader, Odd. How you doing? I just realized that this is the last episode for this season, and not just this this season per se, uh, that we don't really have seasons, but this is the last episode for the year. And, uh, I don't know, I got struck with a little bit of, like, sadness. Like, we are, this is closing 2023. This this is our closing of the year episode that we typically would do. Um, so, uh, that being said, we do have a plan for tonight. It is not your typical, oh, no, we're going to be sad and, you know, be upset that the year is over or anything like that. No, we're going to give you weird Christmas traditions from around the world. Because, you know, why not? Everybody knows about uh, what we do, you know, what the the mainstream and the masses do for Christmas. Uh, you know, we, we chop down a tree, we put a bunch of boxes underneath it, we light a fire. You know, it's a good time. Everybody laughs and, and has a blast. But there are some, tr- some traditions from the rest of the world that you guys just wouldn't believe. And, you know, a couple of them I'm... I'm I'm actually not necessarily all that upset about possibly adopting. <laughs> but before we get into the episode, you know, we try and do a, a catch up on uh, what we may have missed for the last couple of weeks. If you missed the last episode for any reason, understand that starting next year, hey, Motor City Candleworks, uh, I got my two favorite businesses here. Uh, this page took so long to load. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, But uh, so we typically do a catch up. And if you missed last week's episode uh, or the last episode that we did. Thank you for the prime sub, Mr. Brown. Uh, If you missed our last episode, we announced that we are starting two new shows next year. Yay, Angel. Uh, Where's that fucking raccoon? Um, we, uh, we mentioned we're starting two new shows next year, and the first show is going to start later in January. Uh, I believe we were talking it would be the January 17th, the 20, 27th, something like that. Uh, yo, from Chicago to Damast. Um. Uh, so anyways, uh, we'll be starting a show called Case Closed, and it'll be looking at true crime stories. It'll be uh, Sim's show. Uh, I will be tagging along. She will be basically telling me the, the tale. Although the first story, I will admit, the first one that we've picked is one that I am well-versed with, and we wanted to use it for that reason. Hey, Skelly. Welcome on in, buddy. All right, so that's the first thing we're doing. It's Case Closed. It's Cult of Odd Presents Case Closed. The second show that we're doing is going to be a Patreon exclusive only uh, because we know it's a little bit niche and, you know, uh, it might not be everybody's cup of tea. So uh, we're going to be starting a show for Patreon that will be called um, uh, Cult of Odd Presents Dead of Night. And that is going to be me and a bunch of my friends getting together and telling scary stories. Uh, Each week, someone will bring a scary story to the table to be told. The rest of us will listen to the story, and then we may discuss it a little bit afterwards. And then we disband and go about our way and see you again the following week. 
Um, I'm excited about both of those. Uh, the Cult of Odd is still going to be continuing as well. Um, so what's going to happen is you're still going to only get two regular Cult of Odd episodes every month, but you're also going to end up getting two case-closed episodes every month, right? And then uh, the Patreon, uh, we're going to have uh, a new story. We'll see what we can manage uh, for it. I would like to do a new story every week, but we'll see how things go. Um, there is also something else that I am working on that I, I am not allowed to tell you about. But it is going to be awesome, and I'm so excited. And the people in the chat that are here right now, for the most part, most of them know what it is. And I can't wait to show the rest of you. But enough on that for now. I do want to mention, uh, we've got Sailor Rob. <coughs> Sorry. We've got, oh, Bryce! Yay, Bryce! And Woodgood, hey! All right, so... Sailor Rob in the chat runs Old Mill Coffee, and uh, if uh, you want to know more about Old Mill Coffee, uh, I recommend you doing that. It should have worked. Why didn't it work? Oh, because I spelled it wrong. That's why. I'm an idiot. All right. So, yeah, go to oldmillcoffee.com. Uh, some of the best damn coffee you could ever want, and, and, and I am once... Uh, once we uh, uh, get through the holiday season, I believe, Rob, you'll have an order from me, I'm sure, because uh, I am missing what uh, I had been drinking. Also, um, you know I've mentioned it before, that I have a friend that travels, and uh, every so often when he's on his travels, he, uh, he picks something up for me, something odd. Um, he has brought me playing cards from, Ve uh, not playing cards, but like, uh, trading cards from the Las Vegas strip for the, the, the cat houses that are there. Uh, he has brought me a pipe that is very, uh, naughty shaped. Um, he has also brought me the bald man's hairbrush, which is basically just a flat board with no bristles on it. And yet Tuesday he showed up after his latest adventure out into the world and he brought me a bottle opener. And uh, I got to show you the bottle opener. They, 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 they boobies. They boobies. But that is not all Mr. Brown does. Mr. Brown is also the man behind Motor City Candleworks. And uh, Mr. Brown, I gave you that uh, command to use uh, if you want. No, that is the wrong command. We do not have anything for boobies. Um... But uh, if you go to MotorCityCandleworks.com uh, and you order some of Mr. Brown's finest incense, if you use the code One of Us at checkout, you'll get a discount on your order. So, by all means, if you're looking for handmade uh, and handcrafted incense, body lotions, and more, he just released a new product. Uh, I believe it was a shave oil, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? A shave oil uh, for, like, you know, shaving. Uh, but anyways, if you go to MotorCityCandleworks.com, use the code... I don't know who told you there'd be tits on this channel, but there's not. <laughs> use the code one of us at checkout. You'll get a discount off of uh, your purchase. Thank you, Woodgood. Shave Bar Soap. That's what it is. Shave Bar Soap. Oh, man. How is everyone tonight? God, it's great to see all of With you. With both direction and direction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've missed this, and I'm glad we're going to get to do more of it coming this year. All right. So. Hard no. Hard no. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about. I am amazed, all right? I was hoping we'd hit a specific number before tonight, but I'm not even going to focus on the fact that we didn't hit that. It is December 20th, and we are sitting at 5,802 downloads right now. We were pushing 6K, and I was hoping that we were going to hit 6K, but you know what? I'm not that mad at those numbers because most of those numbers, we hit... Right around 5K mid-month, 
right? And not even. Like, we were up to, like, 3,500 in 12 days. And then it jumped to 4,000 in the next day and a half. And then it has slowly grown to what it is now, 5,802 downloads uh, for the month of December at this point. Um, I'll post the year-end's final numbers. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, for those of you that are, have just found us, I am grateful. For those of you that have been listening to us from the get-go, uh, I am even more grateful. I am so thankful that you guys are, are with us. And uh, uh, Sim has talked me into doing some reaction videos. Um, but in order for us to be able to post them for the things that she wants me to react to, those are going to go to Patreon as well. So if you want to see me uh, watching, listening, and experiencing random things, um, yeah, Patreon's going to be the best bet. Like, she talked me into doing reaction videos. I don't know how, but she did. But yeah, like I said... 5,802 downloads in the, in the month of December. That is amazing, and I cannot wait to see how far we grow from here. And it is directly because of all of you. So, uh, okay, Mr. Brown said he has to travel at the end of January uh, for a family thing, and he'll try to get me something there. Awesome. Um. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful. I very much am. And, uh, you know, I get grumpy at times because, man, if I could turn, translate all those downloads into $1 each each month, God, I'd be fucking happy. <laughs> but I'm happy you're all listening and I'm happy you're all participating and I'm happy you're all interacting. And that's, that's really all I ever wanted. I, I want a community that is strong. I want a community that is, is enjoying each other's company. And I want a community that you can be proud to say you're a part of. Yes, you too can stand up and say, I'm proud to be in a cult. Just like the Christians. Anyways, um, so tonight is all about Christmas traditions from all over the world. And uh, I have to give a big thank you to my wife, Sim. She did all of the research on this. Brew it yourself uh, for this episode. She even talked to people. She did interviews uh, uh, and found out more about the, the traditions and stuff, certain ones. So everyone in chat, say thank you, Sim, and say yay, Sim. Because uh, without her, I would not have been able to do this episode. Hey, Taco. Thank you for that follow, sir. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Majakoa? I think is how you pronounce his, his username here on Twitch. Uh, but I know him as Tacos. Uh, and not Taco as in Angel's Taco. Uh, that's the fucking raccoon. No, I know him as Tacos because uh, he and I met way back in the Xbox 360, Xbox Live days. And I was doing the radio show and uh, he was an aspiring YouTuber at that point. Um, and he's done really well with uh, content creation and not only creation, but content management and understanding how the algorithms work and everything. And uh, we've kind of, we've circled around each other, just keeping an eye and making sure the other one's doing okay. So um, thank you for that follow, Tacos. All right. Are we ready to jump in to holiday traditions? Burnout Paradise. Yep, that's true. That's exactly where we met. My uh, user picture was a foot. <laughs> uh, all right. So, as I stated at the beginning of the episode, we all know the Christian and, and, and pagan traditions, right? We, we know Christians have Christmas, pagans have Yule. 
Um, we know that there are presents, that we know that there is a tree, we know the decorations, we know pretty much all there is to know uh, at maybe a base level, all right? We know that Santa Claus is based off uh, St. Nicholas. Um, we know, thanks to cultural uh, in uh, cultural uh, influences about Krampus, who was the uh, flip side of Santa, the German. Although we will be talking about Krampus a little bit later, so stay tuned for that one. Um, but there are holiday traditions from all over the world. And some of them are actually pretty friggin' interesting. Um, and never one to shy away from knowledge and, and information um, I I am excited to share these with you the first one we're going to talk about is from Italy it is titled it is called the gift giving witch in Italian folklore uh, the Bafana is an old woman or witch who delivers gifts to children throughout Italy on Epiphany Eve the night of January 5th. Everybody just, I guess, has a, a mass awakening that night. Uh, in a similar way to how Santa Claus or, or the three Magi Kings did things. A popular belief is the name der derives from the uh, Feast of Epiphany uh, in popular folklore. The Bafana visits all the children of Italy on the eve of the Feast of Epiphany to fill their socks with candy and presents if they are good, or a lump of coal or dark candy if they're bad. I bet it was black licorice and I'd be happy as shit. Um, in many poorer parts of Italy, and in particular rural Sicily, a stick in the stocking was placed instead of coal. Uh, being a good housekeeper, many say she will sweep the floor before she leaves. To some, sweeping means the sweeping away of the problems of the year. The child's family typically leaves a small glass of wine, there you go, Woodgood, and a plate of a few morsels of food, often regional or local for the Bafana. I love black licorice. How dare you? It is, like, my favorite. Like, Easter rolls around, I just want a bag of black jelly beans. That's it. You ain't got to do anything else. I, I don't need nothing else. I love me some black jelly beans. <laughs> Shut up, Woodgut. <laughs> uh, she's usually portrayed as a hag riding a broomstick through the air, wearing a black shawl, and is covered in soot because she enters the children's houses through the chimney. She is often smiling and carries a bag or hamper filled with candy, gifts, or both. That wasn't the witch that shit in your cat box. I'm pretty sure it was you. You got drunk and shit in your own kitty litter. Christian, or Christian legend had it that the Bafana was approached by the biblical magi, also known as the Three Wise Men or the three kings, a few days before the birth of the infant Jesus. They asked for directions to where the Son of God was, and as they had seen his star in the sky, but she did not know. She provided them with shelter for a night, and she was considered the best housekeeper in the village, with the most pleasant home. The Magi invited her to join them on the journey to find the baby Jesus, but she declined, stating she was too busy with her housework. Later, Bafana had a change of heart and tried to search out the, astro the astrologers and Jesus. That night, she was not able to find them, so to this day, Bafana is searching for the little baby. She leaves all the good children toys and candy or fruit, while the bad children get coal or dark candy, uh, onions or garlic. Man, okay, so like dark candy, I'm going to assume is black licorice. I like onions. I like garlic. It sounds like my bread and butter for this holiday is to be as nasty and as mean as I can be throughout the year because I'm going to get shit that I actually want. <laughs> Look at my fat ass! Like, all right, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make potatoes. I'll make, I'll make soup. I don't care. 
just just leave me a little bit of stuff. I don't even like soup, but I'll make it. Uh, popular tradition tells that if Bafana spots that someone sees her, <laughs> black licorice, onions, and garlic. Yeah, all right. <laughs> There you go. According to Skelly, if you cut me open, black licorice, onions, and garlic will fall out. Kind of like if you unravel Oogie Boogie, he's just full of bugs. I'm I'm full of uh, black onions or black onions. Yeah, black black gar. Well, black garlic is a real thing. Can I fucking English tonight? Black licorice, onions, and garlic. There we go. Popular tradition tells that if Bafana spots that someone sees her, they will receive a playful thump on the shoulder from her broomstick as she doesn't wish to be seen. This aspect of the tradition may be designed to keep children in their beds. Uh, another commonly heard Christian legend of Laba, Laba, uh, Labafana, mouth got stuck there, uh, starts at the time of the birth of baby Jesus. In this telling, Bafana spent her days cleaning and sweeping, one day, the Magi came to her door in search of the baby Jesus. However, Bafana turned them away because she was too busy cleaning. Feeling guilty, she eventually decides to find Jesus on her own by following the bright light, also known as the big star in the sky, which she believes points the way. She brings along a bag filled with baked goods and gifts for Jesus and a broom to help the new mother clean. Why does that sound like tantamount to giving your wife a vacuum cleaner on her birthday or Mother's Day? Like, you just had a baby. Here's a broom, bitch. Get to cleaning. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, despite her best efforts, she never finds him. According to this telling, Bafana is still searching after all these centuries for the newborn messiah. On the eve of the Epiphany, Bafana comes to every house where there is a child and leaves a gift. Although she has been unsuccessful in her search, she still leaves gifts for children everywhere because the Christ child can be found in all children. Aw, isn't that sweet? Uh, the, the Bafana is celebrated throughout all of Italy and has become a national icon. In the regions of Marches, Umbria and uh, Latium. Uh, her figure is associated with the uh, papal states where the epiphany held the most importance. Urbania is thought to be her official home. Every year there is a big festival held to celebrate the holiday. About 30,000 to 50,000 people attend the festivities. Hundreds of Bafanas are present, swinging from the main tower. They juggle, they dance, and they greet children. That sounds scarier than fucking Pennywise. Can you imagine a whole fucking street full of Pennywises just dancing around? <laughs> Bryce says, and I thought Santa was creepy. Uh, and Bryce said, brooms for everyone. <laughs> No, Sim is not getting a broom for Christmas, and if she did, she'd shove it straight up your ass. Uh, traditionally, all Italian children may expect to find a lump of coal in their stockings. Actually, rock candy made black with food coloring, as every child has been at least occasionally bad during the year. Well, I guess that's a realistic look on things, because, I mean, everybody's a bit of an asshole each year. Some of us more than others. But I don't know, what do you guys think of the Bufano tale? You know, it's uh, it's very close to how uh, Santa Claus is, is mentioned. You know, toys and uh, socks and coal for the bad kids. But uh, I don't know, what do you guys think about this? Mr. Brown says, very intriguing. Uh, Sim says, it's a unique spin on Santa. I think so, Yeah. You know, and it's, it, you know, they you could see that they were like, yes, uh, the baby Jesus is important to this story. Please don't hang me or crucify me. I promise it's all about the baby Jesus and this woman. I know, I know, I know. Women are bad. Women are bad. I get it. I get it. I get it. I know. It's still about the baby Jesus and this woman. She's really good at cleaning, y'all. 
I like this one. It's not super creepy. It's not. Don't you dare. Good God. <laughs> Fucking canceled. Boom. But the context, he was just being. It doesn't matter the context. Uh, no, I got a feeling when I run it through, uh, the, the thing that both, uh, uh, Ice and I use, uh, it'll pull that one and be like, women are bad. Ah, no. All right. <coughs> Apologize. <laughs> That's true. They already did try to cancel me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh and uh you know just so everyone is aware uh that the i i i don't give a fuck when you comment and try to be like nasty or think you're being slick to me here's the thing the way i look at it i said what i said you fucking deal with it that is my 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 outlook I said what I fucking said. You go deal with it. I'm done. What's nasty? <laughs> I don't see clips being made. So, no, you ain't. You ain't doing that. I'm clipping that. No, you ain't. You ain't clipping shit. All right. They were, too. They were so mad. They were so upset. Okay, so Ice and I, uh, we we talked about the, the GTA trailer on his show, uh, The Damas Podcast, or The Dumbass Podcast. Um, and we we were talking about the, the video gaming industry as a whole. And uh, we got on the topic of microtransactions. And I I, I stand by this microtransactions in the state of the gaming industry is directly related to the parents ruining it like gamer parents giving their kids money for v bucks and uh, robux and and uh, dick bucks and whatever else kind of bucks there are right so like i stated this that's my belief and i said this on an episode of his his show and he he clipped it and made a youtube short out of it and everybody lost their mind how dare me what did the fuck is he even talking about ah! and i'm just sitting there like ah! <laughs> fuck you and so I went back uh, and commented, and I doubled down on my statement, and I'm just waiting to see if it generates any more fucking uh, uh, commentary and views for for uh, for ice. Cause yeah, I'm not sorry. I I meant what I said. There we go. I said what I said. There you go. Yeah. All right. Go fuck yourself. Uh, uh, I, uh, okay, uh, later, I guess. I don't know. All right, let's move into the next tradition. So, the Bafana, kind, sweet lady, which, you know, gives gifts, sweeps up, you know, dances around with mops and brooms, kind of like Mickey. Um, kind of sweet, right? Well... Dead Horse Caroling. Dead Horse Caroling comes from Wales. The uh, <clears throat> Mari Lude, right? I think that's how I'm saying it. Uh, let's see. No. Afari Lude. Uh, Ivari Lude. Uh, whatever. Anyways. Is a wassailing folk custom from south of or from in South Wales. The tradition entails the use of uh, an epitomous hobby horse, which is made from a horse's skull mounted on a pole and carried by an individual hidden under a sackcloth. The 
The custom was first recorded in 1800, with subsequent, account, subsequent accounts of it being re, uh, produced in the early 12th century. According to these, the Mara Lued was a tradition performed at Christmas time by groups of men who would accompany the horse on its travel around the local area. And although the makeup of such groups varied, they typically included an individual to carry the horse, a leader, and individuals dressed as stock characters such as Punch and Judy. Um, for those of you that don't know Punch and Judy, they were puppets um, from back in the, the like early days of TV and theater and, and everything like that. Um, and uh, I want you to know that I once considered converting to Punch and Judaism. But I'm bumped. Um, the men would carry the Mary Lewis to the local houses where they would request entry through song. The householders would be expected to deny them entry again through song. And the two sides would continue their responses to one another in this manner. Let me in. Go the fuck away. That. that That's what they're expecting you to do. Right? <laughs> Which, by the way, the deep baritone there, that's me. Go the fuck away. Why didn't you text first? Do you have a pizza? <laughs> Uh, if the householders eventually relented, the team would be permitted entry and given food and drink. So they're fucking terrorizing you through song. It's, it's musical terrorism. <laughs> you know those episodes that every, like, every show eventually does when they've gone too deep into seasons and they're running out of ideas. They do that musical episode where everybody's running around jumping and dancing and singing and we're all like, how can nobody fucking notice this? Well, they notice. And apparently, if you don't sing back, you, you have to feed them. <laughs> Unless you have tacos and beers and then come on in. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> although the custom was given various names, it was best known... I'm just seeing clip after clip. Just go the fuck away. <laughs> oh. oh, cheesy. Oh, cheesy. Welcome, Mr. Poof. Although the customs was uh, the custom was given various names. It was best known as the Mary Lewis. The uh, entomology of this term remains the subject of academic debate. Folklorist Lorith uh, C. or was that Lorith? C. Pete believed that the term meant Holy Mary, uh, and thus was a reference to Mary, Mother of Jesus. Why was she horse-faced? Was she, was Mary ugly? Do we know if the the Mother of God was a butterface? No? All right. Um, while folklorist E.C. Cott um, thought... <laughs> E.C. Cott thought it was more likely the term had originally meant gray mare, referring to the head's uh, equine appearance. Several earlier folklorists uh, to examine the topic, uh, such as Pete... And Ellen Atlinger, Atlinger believed the tradition once be uh, had once been a pre-Christian religious rite. Although scholarly uh, scholars' support for this interpretation has declined amid a lack of supporting evidence, 
the absence of late medieval references to such practices, and the geographical dispersal of the various British hooded animal traditions, among them the hoodening of Kent, the broad of Cotswolds, and the old ball. Hey, Cheesy, they just mentioned you. Uh, old Tup and Old Horse of Northern England have led to suggestions that they derive from the regionalized popularization of the 16th and 17th century fashion for hobby horses among the social elite. Mr. Poof. <laughs> uh, although the tradition declined in the early mid early mid 20th century, uh, partly due to opposition from local Christian clergy, apparently uh, the clergy didn't like you prancing around with a dead horse on your head, terrorizing people for food and drink through song. Yeah, but it's all ass, Cheesy. It's 50% horse's ass. You didn't even get the benefit of being hung like a horse. Uh, yeah, but the, the Christians got mad. Imagine that. And uh, let's see, the tradition of client, Christian clergy, uh, and changing social conditions. Uh, it was revived in new forms in the mid to latter part of the century. Tradition has also inspired various artistic de depictions, appearing, for instance, in the work of the painter Clive Hicks Jenkins and the poet Vernon Watkins. <laughs> nope, hung like a small sawfly. Aww. You know, is a sawfly bigger than a gnat? Because, I mean, it could be worse then, right? Would that make you daddy by nature? I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, Mary Lou in itself consists of a horse's skull that is decorated with ribbons and affixed to a pole. Uh, to the back of the skull is attached a white sheet which drapes down to conceal... Uh, both the pole and the individual carrying the vice. Kind of like a glory hole, right? It conceals the pole and the, the carrying device. Uh... <laughs> uh, he did the chat. <laughs> Oh, on occasion, the horse's head was uh, represented not by a skull, but was instead made of wood or even paper. In some instances, the horse's jaw was able to open and close as a result of a string or lever attached to it. And there are accounts of pieces of glass being affixed into the eye sockets uh, of some examples, representing eyes. An observer of the tradition as it was performed in uh, Lang... Uh, Langenwild? Langenwild? During the 19th century, noted that uh, preparation for the activity was co a communal event, with many locals involving themselves in the decorating of the Mary Lewitt. <laughs> but it takes a, a long time to get to London in a rowboat. Right? But, you know, as you're rowing, you're getting them long strokes in. It's about the only chance you got, right? That's 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 the only chance you have for a long stroke is that, that rowing, right? No? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Um... The Mary Lewin custom was performed during, uh, performed during winter festivities, uh, specifically around the dates of Christmas and New Year. However, the precise date on which the custom was performed varied between villages, and in a number of cases, the custom was carried out sev several consecutive nights. <laughs> uh, there is a unique example provided by an account from Gower in which the head was kept buried throughout the year, only being dug up for use during the Christmas season. So let me just stash this. Uh, well, you know, I, that'd probably be a good way to, to really get it down to, to pure bone, though, right? Because you figure they're not going to sit there and fully strip it and, and whatnot. Right? So that makes sense. Bury it. Let the, the bugs do a lot of the work. Then you, you know, dig it up before Christmas, clean it off, slap it on a pole, put a sheet around it, and hope nobody thinks you're 
one of those people in a sheet. Of course, back then, I guess those people didn't exist like that. Anyways, um, the custom use uh, the custom used to begin at dusk, and often lasted late into the night. The Mary Lewid partly consisted of four to seven men who often had colored ribbons and rosettes attached to their clothes and sometimes wore a broad sash around the waist. There was usually a smartly dressed leader who carried a staff, stick, or whip, and sometimes other stock char characters, such as the Merry Men, who played music, and Punch and Judy, both men with blackened faces, often brightly dressed, Punch carried a long metal fire iron, and Judy had a besom. The Mary Lewid party would approach the house and sing a song in which they requested admittance. The inhabitants of the house would then offer excuses for why the team could not enter. The party would sing a second verse and then debate between the two sides, known as the uh, Ponco. A form of musical battle similar to flighting. The fuck is flighting? This would continue until the household inhabitants ran out of ideas, at which time they were obligated to allow the party entry and to provide them with ale and food. An account, uh, an account from uh, Nan G uh, Nant Gar describe such a performance in which the Punch and Judy characters would cause a noise, with Punch tapping the ground to the rhythm of the music and rapping on the door with the poker, while Judy brushed the ground, house walls, and windows with a broom. The householders had to make Punch promise that he would not touch their fireplace before he entered the building. Otherwise, it was the local custom that before he left, he would rake out the fire with his poker, in the case from the Langengold, yeah. However, there was no interplay between the householders and troop, but rather the latter were typically granted entry automatically after singing the first verse of their song. Once inside, the entertainment continued with the Mary Lewis running around, neighing and snapping its jaws, creating havoc, frightening the children, and perhaps even the adults. So basically, what this sounds like is you're at home with your family and your drunk ex-girlfriend shows up with four or five of her friends and they just start causing havoc. Cause, cause, cause that doesn't sound fun. It, it, it just, it, I'm sure it's supposed to be, but. I'm in my pajamas. I've already, I'm already like two or three bowls deep for the night. The last thing I'm going to want to deal with is a bunch of loud ass trunks. Uh, <clears throat> the folklorist Loreth Pete uh, believed that in recorded examples of uh, Glamorgan, it was apparent that the Mary Lewis custom had become indistinguishable from the practice of wassailing although added that there were still some examples of wassailing that did not involve the Mary Lewis. He added that links between Mary Lewis and wassailing were also apparent from recorded, exam recorded examples in other parts of Wales, thus <clears throat> opining the, that Mary Lewis represented a variant of the wider wassailing custom that was found throughout Britain. And there's, uh, I can't. Hold on. Can I do this real quick? No. There's a picture here and I'll uh I'll see how I can get it to you guys. Um but it it's creepy as fuck. It's a dude in like a, a three-piece suit and a top hat uh walking another dude that has a sheep drape a sheep draped over him and a fucking I know it's flowers, but in black and white, it just looks like meat and carcass. So it's probably a better thing that I'm not showing it because, you know, you don't want uh, to get hit by Twitch's terms of services. All right. So we've been to Wales and we've been to Italy. Let's go to Guatemala. 
burning of the devil. Burning of the devil, or La Quema del Diablo, is a tradition held every December 7th at 6 in the evening sharp. Families build bonfires outside their homes and burn effigy, uh, burn an effigy of Satan. It is a tradition that many Guatemalans take part as a way to cleanse their home from the devils that lurk in their home, creeping behind the furniture and hiding under the bed. Jesus, Cheesy, they're really trying to get rid of you, aren't they? Uh, burning of the devil can be traced to colonial times, a tradition that started, sin that started since the 18th century. Held on the eve of the feast of the Immaculate Conception as a prelude to the holiday season. Those who could afford it adorns the front of their houses with lanterns, but those who have lesser means build bonfires from their trash to celebrate the occasion. A symbolic tradition with a belief that the fire burns the devil and serves as pur a purifying element. <laughs> Immaculate, it was me. I like the idea that, yeah, we're poor. Um, we we want Christmas lights too, but all we got is this trash heap. So it's going to smell god awful, but uh, sure is going to be pretty though. Ah, there you go. There's the picture. Um... As the Virgin Mary was the blessed one to conceive the baby Jesus must be free from any form of evil. Therefore, the event serves as a burning the devil to clear the way for Mary's feast. Yep, we got to set fire to the entire maternity ward so Cheryl Ann back there can give birth. We don't know which one of them babies is bastards, but we need to get them out of there before Cheryl Ann gives birth because she she is the new mother of God, right? She 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 go be I know, I know she she smokes and, and chews skull. I get it. I got I understand she is not the, the picture of what would be considered purity. But uh, if we don't get rid of all them babies there in the maternity ward, uh, Cheryl Ann won't be able to give birth to the baby Jesus. And actually, we're going to change his name to Baby Cletus, because that Jesus name sounds a little, uh, well, a, a little too uh, exotic for our liking. Drink those silver for <laughs> All right. Through, though the celebration may sound fun, it is controversial, especially for environmentalist groups. Back in the days, most paper were uh, most paper was burned uh, for the cleansing ritual. But now, piles of rubbish are mostly made of plastic and rubber that causes air pollution. The Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources released a widely publicized statement back in 2008. Warning that one hour of a bonfire uh, containing rubber pla and plastic is equal to the carbon dioxide production by a million and a half cars in circulation at the same time. Over time, the tradition evolved from burning piles of garbage and pieces of furniture to being replaced by an effigy of Satan in the form of piñatas. It's the baby Cletus! Um... The tradition has special significance in Guatemala City because of its anticipation of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The patron saint of the city along the st street of Zona 1 is uh, the historic city center. Many vendors pile the street selling stuff associated with uh, the La Quema de Diablo. Uh, from firecrackers to simple and intricate devil piñatas <clears throat> in different parts of the city, people celebrate and burn their own devil piñatas. The tradition continues as the idea is to burn all the bad from the previous year and to start anew from the ashes, like a phoenix, rising from the ashes of your old life. 
Uh, it is widely observed throughout the county. The devil is burned at the stroke of six. Uh, in Antigua, the former capital of the country, a devil three stories tall is constructed and burned in the city square. That was fucking loud. That one got me. Son of a bitch. It actually got me. Uh, but I'm thinking, so this was like Burning Man's origin, right? Uh, three three story tall devil constructed and burned at the city square. It's like super quiet. <laughs> Twelve pack of undies from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> I start <coughs> I started this episode with a clean butthole. I'm not gonna end it that way. Fuck you, man. <laughs> All right, so what do you guys think of uh, the horsehead tradition and the burning devil? I kind of like the idea of the burning devil one. I like the idea of, uh, like, trying to, to, you know, push out all the bad from the previous year. Uh, they say that fire does cleanse, and so, you know, it makes sense that uh, they, they would use an effigy of evil and try to burn it away to... Uh, you know, set themselves up for a better year. We do the same thing, right? You know, everybody makes that tradition to burn away fat. New year, new me. New year, new me. It is gonna be my year. You notice, though, ain't nobody saying that shit for 2024 because the motherfuckers finally learned, right? Like, this, this ain't nobody on social media right now going, 2024 is gonna be my year. Because don't nobody want to claim that shit. Nobody wants to take ownership of it. Nobody wants to have anything to do with it. I think everybody has just kind of finally learned to keep their head down and hope the year just kind of creeps on by. All right. Let's move on to the next one. The Lucky Spiderwebs. This one's a fairly short one. Um... Lucky Spiderwebs comes to us from the Ukraine. Uh, fastidious housewives usually shoo spiders on their webs from the corners of the house or their hiding places in furniture. But in Ukraine, at Christmas time, these nocturnal arachnids may discover a welcome mat at the door, as spiders and their webs represent good luck for Ukrainians. Acceptance of spiders in the home, as with many other Ukrainian traditions, originates in a legend. According to the ancient storytellers, there was once a widow living in her cramped, cold hut with her children. One day, a pine cone dropped from the tree outside and took root. The children, excited for the prospect of a tree for Christmas, tended the seedling and made plans for how they would decorate the tree. Poverty was the way of life for the small family, and when Christmas approached, the widow knew that they would not be able to decorate the tree. The children and the window accept, widow accepted their fate and went to bed on Christmas Eve. The tiny tree branches bare. <clears throat> but the household spiders heard the children's sobs and spun intricate webs on the tree. Early on Christmas morning, the children cried, Mother! Mother! Wake up and see the tree! It's beautiful! The widow rose to find that during the cold night, a spider had spun its web around the fragile branches. As the rays of the sun crept along the floor and silently climbed the tree, the glow touched the threads of the web, turning each one into silver and gold. And, as the story goes, from that day forward, the widow never wanted for anything. To remember this miracle, Ukrainians still decorate their trees with artificial spider webs, uh, to usher in good luck and fortune for the coming year. So the next time a spider decides that your home is warm and cozy, think twice before fetching a broom to sweep the, sw the cobwebs away. I like that. I like spider webs. I don't like them in my house, mainly because I tend to walk into them. But um, I like spider webs because they are pretty when they're outside kind of away from where i i've got to fucking travel right but i think that's a neat tradition 
And it's weird too, because like silver and gold, I thought they just meant like of color, but apparently no. That uh, that spider is uh, what was it? Uh, the Rumpelstiltskin story, you know? They they spun uh, straw into gold. Well, this spider turned butt goo into silver and in, in gold. Butt goo. Speaking of butt goo, we have our next tradition coming. But before we do that, I want to mention, uh, if you notice here on the screen underneath where it's, our socials are, there are two images there. And if you follow this link, merchandising but if you follow that link right there it'll take you to a, a page on uh, take you to our facebook page and you can vote uh by reacting to the image with one of two reactions for our next uh t-shirt design voting ends december 31st at midnight and the design will be available shortly after the first of the year but I figured this way you guys can choose what you would like to wear, what you would like to have on any piece of merch, whether it be a t-shirt, whether it be a coffee mug. Um, this way you guys get a say in what gets released. And so, it's thumbs up or you're wrong, huh? Uh, but, uh, so whatever one wins, whatever one has the most votes at the, the end of uh, December, um, I will take and turn into t-shirts, coffee mugs, and uh, probably a few other things. And <clears throat> we'll let you guys know when uh, they're up on the merch store for you to be able to buy. I, uh, I, w I think I'm going to do that more often with our merch designs too, honestly. I, I think I want to get you guys involved. That way I'm, I'm putting out stuff that you're actually interested in versus the stuff that I think is cool um that hasn't been selling <laughs> cuz apparently i don't know what people want cheesy said it's thumbs up or you're wrong all right well there you go um either you vote thumbs up or cheesy poof ninja shows up at your door and possibly impregnates you he'll sing first He'll sing to gain entry. You'll have to, you'll 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 have to to to, you know, rap battle him essentially to keep him from coming into your house and impregnating you. But uh, you know, maybe it'll be a good time. <laughs> it will be immaculate. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to move on? This one. This one is great. Since we were talking about butt goo. <clears throat> This one comes for, to us from Catalonia. And this one actually has some uh, media accompaniment that goes along with it. So uh, you guys are in for a treat here. This tradition is called the shitting log. And I know what you're thinking. What? There's a Christmas tradition about shitting logs? Nope. Not quite. The form of TOD de Nadal, found in many Catalan homes during the holiday season, is a hollow log about 30 centimeters, so 12 inches long. Recently, the Tio has come to stand up on two or four stick legs with a broad, smiling face painted on its higher end, enhanced by a, litter, uh, a, uh, a littler red sock hat, 
uh, miniature of the tradition, uh, a traditional barone baronita. And often a three-dimensional nose. Those accessories have been added only in recent times, altering the more traditional and rough natural appearance of a dead piece of wood. Again, talking about cheesies. <laughs> a dead piece of wood. Uh, beginning with the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th, one gives the Tio a little bit to eat every night and usually covers him with blankets so that he will not be cold. The sco story goes that in the days preceding Christmas, children must take good care of the log, keeping it warm and feeding it, so that it will defecate presents on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. On Christmas Day, in some households, one puts the teal partly in the fireplace and orders it to defecate. The fire part of this tradition is no longer as widespread as it once was, since many modern homes do not have a fireplace. To make it defecate, one beats the Tio with sticks while singing various songs of Tio de Danal. The tradition says, says that before beating the Tio, all the kids have to leave the room and go to another place of the house to pray, asking for the Tio to deliver a lot of presents. Nowadays, the praying tradition has been left behind. Still, children go to a different room, usually the kitchen, to warm their stick next to a fire. This makes the perfect excuse for the relatives to do the trick and put the presents under the blanket while the kids are praying or warming their sticks. The Tio does not drop large objects, as those are considered to be brought by the three wise men. It does leave candies, nuts, and torones, and small toys depending on the region of Catalonia. It may also give out dried figs. When it comes out of the Tio, or what comes out of the Tio is communal rather than an individual gift, and it was shared by everyone there. The Tio is often popularly called Kaga Tio, or the Shitting Log, or Poo Log. This derives from the many songs of Tio de Nadal uh, that begin with the, this phrase, which was originally, in context of the songs, an imperative, Shit Log. The use of this expression as a name is not, to be, uh, is not believed to be part of the ancient tradition, and is its use is discouraged. A song is sung during the celebration. After, the, after hitting the T.O. softly with the stick during the song, uh, it is hit harder on other words, Cago T.O. Then somebody puts their hand under the blanket and takes a gift. The gift is open, and then the song begins again. There are many Cago T.O. songs connected to the holiday and the log. Now, Sim provided the following uh, and some variants and, and whatnot, but I dug up a, a version of the song, and I'm going to play it for you so you can hear it. Cagatio, cagatoro, te vayas do peño, non cagwe sarengades, que son más asalades. Cagatoro, que son mes pons. Cagatio, cagatoro, si no donare un cop tu besto. <laughs> I, 
you know, I, I, um, I just don't know. I mean, I, I guess it's a cute tradition. Hard no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hard no. <laughs> you know what? Uh, and I will say this. Uh, though we're having a laugh and, and, and you know, uh, joking around a little bit, uh, if for any reason anyone from any of the cultures that celebrate these holidays are watching, we are not, we are not necessarily making fun of them. I genuinely think these are interesting, but they, they are a little out there for us, but I'm sure that there are things that are out there that we do for you. So, um, that being said, I, the I, shitting log, I, I just, I, uh, I don't know. I just don't know. I have no idea. Uh, we have a mini one here um, that is comes to us from Norway. Um, it is called Hide the Brooms. Um, some Norwegians believe witches and evil spirits roam the night sky on Christmas Eve. And what is a witch's preferred mode of transportation? A broomstick. So out of, a, out of an abundance of caution, people in Norway hide all of the brooms in their houses to prevent any witches from getting their hands on them. Sometimes people will take it a step further by f firing a warning gunshot into the air to scare them off. This just sounds like down south. Take that, you nasty witches! You stay out of my house! Stop it! Sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, but no, uh, witches and, and ghosts and, and, and like, one of the things that has always amazed me is like, we're, we're super into like the creep factor on Halloween, right? You know, we're super into ghosts and goblins and, and, and witches and all that stuff on Halloween. But when you start looking into the culture behind Christmas or our yule celebration or you know any of the 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 old pagan roots or anything like that uh, ghost stories were were told at christmas time as well i mean think about it we have uh the tale of ebenezer scrooge right he was visited by three spirits um we have uh, a ton of traditions that revolve around supernatural and kind of scary entities. Think about it. Santa is essentially a spirit that you call to throughout the month of December and invite into your home. Right? What are your uh, Christmas decorations, if not an altar? What are your Christmas carols, if not the same as how witches call to the signs? What else do you call an entity that can enter your home, even though all of your doors and windows are locked? You leave out an offering of milk and cookies to appease Santa. All in the hopes that this spirit of Christmas will enter your home. So, if you think about it, you are uh, summoning a, a spirit to your home every Christmas. You are summoning angels, you are summoning God, you are summoning Santa, you are summoning all these spirits to come to your home. And uh, you even go so far as to indoctrinate your children to believe that they did show up. You're teaching your children how to beckon a spirit 
every Christmas. And uh, also teaching them how to thank them because, you know, um, that's the offering, right? That's the, you're sacrificing the milk and cookies. And, oh, go one further with the sacrifice idea. You often leave gingerbread men. They're shaped like people for Santa to eat. It's a sacrifice. An offering. They, they, they look like people. Yeah, it's literally mirror, mirroring what uh, uh, some uh, 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 pagans and witches do with Lilith and Hectate. And, and other entities. So bear that in mind. <laughs> I mean ginger people. <laughs> It's all right, Cheesy. You can leave out the ginger people if you want. Santa will eat them too, I'm sure. Or if not, the Krampus. <laughs> all right. Let's see. We've got this one. This is the one that she did the interview on. Uh, and then, hold on. Okay. We've got two more. Two more traditions. This one comes to us by way of Mexico. Make it a thing, Rob. Make it a thing. That's that's the beauty of of these these traditions and whatnot. They start small at first. Woo! They killed the cops. Oh shit! Get out of the car, man. Oh, man, this is the cop car. This is. Hello. You boys like Mexico? Yeah! Uh, but that's the thing. Start the tradition yourself. Start start doing something about it. Uh, uh, next year, once uh, you know the the deck is finished, I'm sure it's finished now. But next year, you know, decorate the old mill up and put the Krampus in part of your display. All right, Night of the Radishes uh, is an annual event held on December 23rd in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, dedicated to the carving of oversized radishes to create scenes that compete for prizes in various categories. The event has its origins in the colonial period when radishes were introduced by the Spanish. Uh, Oaxaca has a long uh, wood carving tradition, and farmers began carving radishes into figures as a way to attract customers' attention at the Christmas market which was held in the main square on December 23rd. Uh, in 1897, the city instituted the formal competition, and as the city grew, the government has had to dictate or dedicate land to the growing of radishes used for the event, supervising their growth and distribution to competitors. Uh, the event has become popular, attracting over a hundred contestants and thousands of visitors. Since the radishes wilt soon after cutting, the works can only be displayed for a number of hours, which has led to very long lines for those wishing to see them. The event also has displays and competitions for works made with corn husks and dried flowers, which are created with the same themes as those with the radishes. Native to China, radishes were introduced to Mexico City by the Spanish, particularly by the friars. And over time, the crop became used as a side dish or snack, or carved into decorations for special dishes. In the colonial period, the radishes began to be carved with religious themes in relation to the annual Christmas market held in the city of Oaxaca on December 23rd, with the encouragement of priests. The carvings were a marketing gimmick, with farmers using them to attract attention to shoppers in the market in the city plaza. Eventually, people began buying the radishes not only to eat, but to create centerpieces for Christmas dinners. The legend as to how the event began says that one year, in the mid-18th century, the radish crop was so abundant 
that a section lay unharvested for months. In December, two friars pulled up some of these forgotten radishes. The sizes and shapes were amusing, and they brought them and they brought them as curiosities to the Christmas market held on the 23rd of December. The misshapen vegetables attracted attention, and soon they began to, car to be carved and given them a wider vari variety of shapes and figures. In 1897, the mayor of the city, uh, Francesco uh, Vacanzolos, uh, decided to create a formal radish carving competition, which has been held each year since. Over the years, various types of radishes have been used in both Oxican cuisine and for car carving. A large, completely white type called a uh, criollo was used earlier as it did not rot as readily and adopted a more and adopted more capricious forms. While this variety has since disappeared, an image of them can be seen in a work uh, by Diego Rivera called Las Tensiones de San Antonio. Uh, the formal Noche de Robanos uh, competition focuses on the carving of radishes, which can be embellished with other elements. Most entries are scenes that use multiple radishes, with the most traditional being nativity scenes. However, over the hundred plus years the competition has been held, there has been significant diversification in the entries. Common scenes are related to the life in Oaxaca, such as uh, uh, Guadalaza, Podias, and Calendus, I, I don't know, and a kind of traditional party, uh, also featuring Day of the Dead, uh, Danza de Pluma, Pineapple Harvest Dance, and the Chilina from Costa Chica. Oxican history and folklore, as well as the veneration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Waquila, and Our Lady of Solitude, the patron of the state. However, they can also depict other themes such as non-Christmas biblical stories and can even be in protest. The most common elements are people, animals, food, and handcrafts of the state. But they can also include uh, du duendes, snowmen, monsters, and more. Can you imagine if we did that here in the States, right? Like... I'm going to go protest, but let me just carve these radishes first. We'll put our slogan on these radishes, and, and either we're going to hand them out to people or we're going to chuck them at the people we're protesting, one or the other. Ordinarily, the radishes used by the competitors were those raised by local farmers. But as the city has grown and taking over land traditionally dedicated to their cultivation... The municipal government has stepped in, and it has allocated an area near El Tico, El, El Tequo Park uh, to their cultivation. It's true. We carve pumpkins. And some people think we're out of our gourds. Ah, I'll see myself out. Um, uh, let's see, El Tico Park to their cultivation, speci specially grown for the event. They are heavily fertilized, chemically treated, and left in the ground long after normal harvests to allow each uh, to reach monumental sizes uh, for uh, capricious shapes, which also makes them unsuitable for human consumption. The resulting vegetables can be up to 50 centimeters in length. Uh, 10 centimeters or wider, and can weigh up to 3 kilos. It's a big-ass fucking radish. In 2014, 12 tons of radishes were harvested for the event alone. Local authorities monitor the harvest and distribute the crop to the registered contestants on December 18th. The radish currently used has a red skin and a white interior. The use of this radish, which is softer than other varieties, has precipitated a number of strategies different from those used in the past. 
one being the use of the contrast between the skin and the interior, and the other to peel and flatten the red skin for use in clothing items, flags, and more. Typically, participants use knives and toothpicks to create the sculptures. After the tops of the radishes with their long green leaves have been cut off and sometimes used in the scenes, although the carving of the radishes evolved from the area's tradition of wood carving. The current competition does not attract current wood carvers as the material is very different. It's just more of a soft wood, right? They just they just need to get them some blue chew or some hymns. Just toughen that wood back up. The event tracks over 100 participants from the city of Oxica and neighboring communities, especially San Antonio Vel 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 Velasco. Jesus Christ! In 2014, 94 competed in the adult categories, along with 61 youth and 50 children. The contestants registered months in advance. From the 18th to the 23rd, they must plan and design their scenes, generally using the natural shapes of the radishes that have been allotted as a guide. So they drop off a bunch of radishes. And the carvers look at her and go, speak to me, Radish. What do you want to be? And then they sit there and stare at it for hours and hours and hours until the Radish finally fucking talks to them and tells them what seed to carve into its flesh. It's like a creepy version of Veggie Tales. Uh, the actual carving and assembly of the entries occur during the day of December 23rd. There are several categories of participation. For adults, radish sculptures and scenes can be in the tradition, uh, in the traditional or free category, which is determined by the theme. Works in the traditional category are depictions of nativity scenes and those of Oxygen traditions. Those in the free category generally depict more contemporary themes. However, as this function of the event is to preserve tradition, the grand prize of 15,000 pesos is awarded to the winner of the traditional category. <laughs> Speak to me, radish. <laughs> Radishes. That's what they're smoking. And that's 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 that that's it. Um in 2014, the grand prize winner was the entry Dulces Regionales Aquinos by uh, the Vasquez Lopez family. There are also prizes for participants competing as novices and the children's category for those aged 6 to 17 to encourage new generations to continue uh, the tradition. All right. Good night, Motor City. Prizes for the children's categories include bicycles and school supplies. The event also added categories for the scenes made not from radishes, but instead from dried corn husks, and those made with dried flowers. Uh, uh, what are they? The, the immortal? In, immortal flower? Named such as it dries, <coughs> it dries quickly and keeps most of its color. These entries also have several subcategories and generally have similar themes to those done with the radishes. Since the radishes do not keep after they are cut and quickly wilt, the entire event lasts for only a few hours, from the late afternoon to the early evening, uh, with stands set up in the morning before around the main square of the city and taken down the morning after. Visitors are permitted to pass by the stands starting in late in the late afternoon where, with judging and the awarding of prizes taking place at about 9 p.m. with the radish sculptures removed shortly after. The event has become popular attracting thousands of visitors as well as functionaries that can include the state's governor. Despite the creation of the two-line system, the one behind on the raised platform for the visitors to file by the stands. Wait times can be as long as four to five hours to see the entries. Can you imagine that? Like, 
we do some pretty weird shit here, right? Like, waiting in line at, like, car shows and whatnot, you know, to see certain cars. Because, like, I'm in the Motor City. I'm in Detroit. It seems pretty weird to stand around and wait just to look at a car. Um, but, like, could you imagine waiting four to five hours just to see some radishes? I, I'm sure it's a wonderful experience for them, for their culture. It's it's pretty goddamn weird to me. Um, but, like, uh, like Motor City Candleworks said, we carve pumpkins. So, it's not that that weird um and there are pumpkin carving contests uh there are pumpkin painting contests um you know so eh, it may seem weird but it's not it's not too far out of our wheelhouse right you know i i again don't i i i don't believe that i'm going to stand around and wait for several hours to see radishes sculpted into the shapes of uh <clears throat> anything really like you could tell me you have a, a potato chip that looks like johnny depp and i'd be like cool i don't need to see it i don't care but uh i know this is the one where uh a sim actually got a hold of somebody from that culture and and actually asked them a bunch of questions about it to, to help fill this out. <laughs> they did not want to be named. They did not want any recognition whatsoever. And I, I understand that completely. I'm sure that they were like, yeah, this is, this is a pretty weird tradition. And uh, please don't make fun of it. And I don't want anything to, to do with it. What is a pumpkin drop? Is it exactly what it sounds like? They just drop a pumpkin? I know, uh, I know, uh, I forget where, I think it's in the Southern States, but they do pumpkin chunkin, where they build a giant trebuchet and then fling fucking pumpkins across the goddamn field. Is that, is that like what the pumpkin drop is? And I got to remember, there is a bit of a delay, so it'll take them a minute to answer before, uh, you know, all is said and done. But yeah, what the fuck is a pumpkin drop? You know what? I know a better way. Hey. Uh, the biggest pumpkin grown in the state. They put it on a crane and drop it. That's pretty weird not gonna lie that that's 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 pretty weird i'm, a, I'm assuming this is a jesus that is huge he said imagine a car-sized pumpkin lord what kind of car are we talking about here? Are we talking like a compact car or are we talking like a full-size sedan? Look at me. Trying to... <laughs> like, if I was just like, yeah, if it's like a little... Uh, uh... Hun and hundreds of people are staring and waiting for a pumpkin to drop. Wow the size of a gremlin jesus that's a big ass pumpkin i don't know if i'd want to stand with a bunch of other people and watch the goddamn thing hit the ground but you know to each their own right that's pretty weird though not gonna lie that's pretty goddamn weird so like is it a big event? Like, what do you guys do afterwards? Does everybody just pile up their cars and go home? And like, y'all see that pumpkin hit the ground? Yep. If you can dig it up, you should share it with me. I want to see that video. That's so weird. That is so weird to me. All right.
That is a big ass sounding pumpkin, though. Jesus Christ. Ah, so they do it as a way to get people there to like uh, buy pumpkins and stuff. Okay, that makes a little more sense. That's that's an attraction at that point. Please, please come up buy our pumpkins, and if you buy pumpkins, watch us drop this big ass pumpkin on the ground. Man, I bet that bitch hits with a thunk, too. Like, you can feel it when it hits the ground. Fucking weird, man. Fucking weird. All right, kitties. Now is the time that we've all been waiting for. So we've talked about several other traditions that people aren't aware of. Now, we are going to talk about Krampus. Krampus became popular in the the pop culture uh, several years ago when the, the movie Krampus was released. If you've not seen the movie... It is. It became an immediate uh, odd family tradition, like House of Odd tradition. We have two movies that we watch every year at Christmas. Uh, the first one is Santa's Sleigh. It is a movie starring Bill Goldberg as Santa, who travels through uh, the town of Hell, Michigan, just obliterating everyone who is just terrible. Uh, there's more to the story than that, but that's the, the basis of it. And the other one is the Krampus movie. Those two movies are our holiday traditions. Everybody else is watching, like, It's a Wonderful Life and, you know, Christmas Vacation and Home Alone and all these things. We're watching the creepy fucking horror movies. So, Krampus. The Krampus is a horned anthropomorphic figure in the central and eastern alpine for- folklore of Europe. And this comes from like Germany, Austria, and Hung- uh, Hungary. Who, during the Advent season, scares children who have misbehaved. Assisting St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus... The pair visit children on the night of December 5th, with St. Nicholas rewarding the well-behaved children with gifts such as oranges, dried fruit, walnuts, and chocolate, while the badly behaved ones only receive punishment from Krampus with birch rods. The origin of the figure is unclear. Some folklorists and anthropologists anthropologists have postulated that it may have been pre-Christian in origin. In traditional parades and such events as the uh, uh, Krampslauf or Krampus Run, young men dressed as Krampus attempt to scare the audience with their antics. Such events occur annually in most Alpine towns. Krampus is featured on holiday greeting cards uh, called Krampus Karten. The history of the Krampus figure has been theorized as stretching back to pre-Christian Alpine traditions, with celebrations involving Krampus dating back to the 6th or 7th century, though there are no written sources before the end of the 16th century. Discussing his observations in 1975, while uh, in Erding, Erdening, a small town in Straya, anthropo- anthropologist John J. Honigman wrote this. The St. Nicholas Festival we are describing incorporates cultural elements widely distributed in Europe, in some cases going back to pre-Christian times. Nicholas himself became popular in Germany around the 11th century. The feast dedicated to this patron of children is only one 
is only one winter occasion in which children and the objects of special attention, others being Martinmas, the Feast of the Holy, uh, the Holy Innocents, and New Year's Day. Masked devils enacting boisterously and making nuisances of themselves are known in Germany since at least the 16th century, while animal masked devils combining dreadful comic uh, <clears throat> uh, dreadful comic antics appeared in medieval church plays. A large literature, much of it by Eastern folklorist, bears on these subjects. Austrians in the community we studied are quite aware of the heathen elements being blended from Christian elements in the St. Nicholas customs and in other traditional winter ceremonies. They believe Krampus derives from a pagan supernatural who was assimilated to the Christian devil. Sorry. Talking so long. Had to uh, rehydrate. Um, the Krampus figures persisted, and by the 17th century... Krampus had been incorporated into Christian winter celebrations by pairing Krampus with St. Nicholas. Although Krampus appears in many variations, most share some common physical characteristics. He is hairy, usually brown or black, and has the cloven hooves and horns of a goat. His long, pointed tongue lolls out as his, at, and he has fangs. This just sounds like Gene Simmons. Uh, Krampus carries chains, thought to symbolize the binding of the devil by the Christian church. He thrashes the chains for dramatic effect. The chains are sometimes accompanied with bells of various sizes. Of more pagan origins is the root, a bundle of birch branches that, Kramp that the Krampus carries, uh, with which he occasionally swats children. The root may have had significance in pre-Christian pagan initiation rites. The birch branches are placed with a whip in some representation, or replaced with a whip in some representations. Sometimes Krampus appears with a sack or a basket strapped to his back. This is to cart off evil children for drowning, eating, or transport to hell. In some of the older versions, some of the older versions make mention of naughty children being put in a bag and taken away. This quality can be found in other companions of St. Nicholas, such as Zwart Piet. The Feast of St. Nicholas is celebrated in parts of Europe on December 6th. On the preceding evening of December 5th, Krampus Night, or Kromschnacht, the wicked, hairy devil appears on the streets, sometimes accompanying St. Nicholas, sometimes on his own. Krampus visit home, visits homes and businesses. The saint usually appears in the eastern rite vestments of a bishop, and he carries a golden ceremonial staff. Unlike North American versions of Santa Claus, in these celebrations, St. Nicholas concerns himself only with the good children, while Krampus is responsible for the bad. Nicholas dispenses gifts, and the Krampus supplies coals and the root. A seasonal pr play that spread throughout the Alpine regions was known as uh, the Nicholas Play. All right, you'll have to shoot it through me through Discord. I'll watch it when I'm done. Uh, inspired by Paradise Plays, which focused on Adam and Eve's encounter with a tempter. The Nicholas Plays featured competition for the human souls and played on the question of morality. In these Nicholas Plays, St. Nicholas would reward children for scholarly efforts rather than good behavior. This is a theme that grew in Alpine regions where the Roman Catholic Church had significant influence. Krampus appears in the folklore of Austria, Bavaria, Bosnia, 
Herzegovina, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Northern Italy, Autonomous Province of Trento, South Tyrol, and uh, Fruli Vuesa, uh, Venezuel, Venezia, Guila, oh God, Slovakia, and Slovenia. In Styria, the root is presented by Krampus to families. The twigs are painted gold and displayed year-round in the house, a reminder to any children who have temporarily forgotten Krampus. In a similar, more, and in sim smaller, more isolated villages, the figure has other beastly companions, such as the antlered wild man figures, and St. Nicholas is nowhere to be seen. These Styrian companions of Krampus are called the Sh Shab Manor or the Ruhan. A toned-down version of Krampus is part of the popular Christmas markets in Austrian urban centers like Salzburg. In these, more tourist-friendly interpretations of Krampus are more humorous than fearsome. Uh, North American Krampus celebrations are, growing, are a growing phenomenon. Similar figures are recorded in neighboring areas of Stobart and ba Bavaria, uh, Klabamov in Austria, and ba Bavaria, while Bartel or Bartel uh, and Wubart are used in the southern part of the country. Other names include Barrel of Bartholomus, um, Schmutzi in the German-speaking Switzerland, Popel or Hulpopa in Würzburg, Zember in Cheb, uh, Balsmarte or Pelsmarte uh, are found in Swabia and uh, Franconia. In most parts of Slovenia, whose culture was greatly affected by the Austrian culture, Krampus is called Parkel and is one of the companions of Miklavs, the Slovenian form of St. Nicholas. <clears throat> In many parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia, Krampus is described as a devil wearing a, a cloth sack around his waist and chains around his neck, ankles, and wrists. As part of the tradition, when a child receives a gift from St. Nicholas, he is given a golden branch to represent his good deeds throughout the year. However, if the child is misbehaved, Krampus will take the gifts for himself and leave only a silver branch to represent the child's bad acts. Every year, there are arguments during Krampus runs. Occasionally, spectators take revenge for whippings and attack Krampus's. In 2013, after several Krampus runs in East Tyrol, a total of eight injured people, mostly with broken bones, were admitted to the district hospital, and over 60 other patients were treated on an outpatient basis. Those are our traditions that we had to talk about. Krampus is uh, by far my favorite of those. I like the idea of... Uh, an anti-Santa, I guess, is the best way to look at it. I don't know. I am not a fan of the Christmas season. I do not like the holiday. I would prefer not to celebrate the holiday. However, I have a wife who absolutely loves the goddamn holiday. So I celebrate the holiday. But I like the idea of the Krampus because at least it gives me something to be interested in in the holiday season. I don't care about the lights. I don't care about the trees. I don't care about the presents. Food's pretty good. But being that I'm a horror fan and I like all things creepy, I like the idea of the Krampus. I like the idea that they're... is a yin to the yang, right? Santa is all cheerful and smiling and present giving. 
And then you have this just evil fucking goat devil thing that hangs out with him and takes care of the bad kids. Uh, I know that there are traditions where uh, it's said in there the Krampus eats the children, like boils them in a pot on the spot. Um, there, there's a decent representation of of it in the movie Krampus. Um, I like the movie because it ends on a down note. That's the other reason I like it. I like movies that that the hero doesn't win. Right. I like when the villain wins. I like when the story has a not so happy ending. There's another movie too. If you are, if you can stomach movies that are in foreign languages, so if you can deal with subtitles, there is a movie called Rare Exports. It is my third favorite movie to watch at Christmas time. It is also a horror movie, but it is really really kind of interesting um basic premise imagine if santa was a cryptid and a group goes out and hunts santas to capture them tame them and train them and then ships them all over the world for uh mall santas and even that description doesn't really do it justice. But it is a good movie. So the three movies for Christmas that I, I cannot wait to watch um, are Santa's Slay, Krampus, and Rare Exports. And I think you guys should check them out too. Make horror part of your Christmas tradition, right? Like, I don't know... I like a horror-related Christmas more than I like the, the fluffy, family-friendly, froofy stuff. Right? I, I'll watch the, the old-school claymation, and and I'll watch the, the wholesome movies and whatnot. Don't get me wrong, but uh, give me horror at every turn. I want horror at Thanksgiving, horror at Christmas, horror at Easter, you know, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, I don't care. Every fucking holiday, give me a decent horror movie to watch. I know you do. Santa Slay is one of your favorites. So there you have it, folks. Those are some traditions from around the world. And if you, uh, you know... Maybe you could incorporate one into your next holiday special. You know, like uh, maybe you want to give the shitting log a try next Christmas. Let your kids freak out over it. Go ahead. Go ahead and retch up under there. Get you some presents. That's right. You, you beat that log. And I love the fact, too, because like I pronounced it as T.O. I don't know how it's actually supposed to be pronounced right. But I know Tio in Spanish is uncle. So in my head, I'm just imagining all these little kids beating their drunk uncle until, like, his pocket's empty. Right? You know, you're going to get uh, maybe a couple of packs of cigarettes, maybe a, uh, a roach or two, you know. You're going to get some Modelo bottle caps, some change, a couple of dollars. A cell phone, a wallet, you know, I just, uh, in my head, I'm imagining them beating up their drunken uncle until his pocket's empty. Um, I want to thank everyone that's been with me this year. 2023 has been an interesting year for us here at the Cult of Odd, and uh, I can't wait to see what 2024 brings for the Cult of Odd. If we keep doing these numbers, um, I'm hoping that sometime by mid-year we're hitting 10,000 downloads a month. That would make me thrilled. You can find us, all the places listed down there on the, on the video here. Uh, for those of you that are, are listening, you already know where to find us. Um, you can connect at all of our socials. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on what used to be known as Twitter. 
we're on Reddit. We're uh, we have our own Discord. Um, <clears throat> there are ways to donate and support. Uh, there is merch to buy. There is all different ways to to help keep us running and keep us bringing you the entertainment that you enjoy. Um, keep downloading the episodes. Keep interacting on on YouTube. Keep interacting on Reddit. You know. This lets us know where we're at and what you're liking. I uh, I like hearing from you guys. I, I like interacting. I know I said earlier, you know, I said what I said and, and fuck you. And then that's mainly for the haters. But for the rest of you that enjoy what we're putting forth, if you have a say, say it, you know. Interact with us. Join our Discord. Join our Reddit. <laughs> fuck you, Woodgood. You gotta realize how fucking loud that is in my ears. I hope every batch you brew from here on out turns out terrible. I hope for the entire year of 2024, you do not get a single drinkable batch of alcohol. I hope you stub your toe when ain't nothing around. I hope every time you fart, a little bit comes out. That's right. But uh, we've had a very good year. And I'm grateful that you've wanted to be a part of it. And I hope you tell others, and I hope you bring more people in. I hope you don't get a single call from your friends with benefits for the whole of 2024. Oh, don't you go getting into this, Ice. I get you. <laughs> No beer and no friends with benefits. That's right. Yeah. And I still got one for you, too. I hope you wake up and your beard's patchy and you can't fix it for three months. <laughs> no, but seriously... Um, I do want to take a moment to uh, all of you in the chat, Bryce, uh, Ice, uh, Woodgood, uh, Angel, uh, Cheesy, uh, Skelly, everyone. Oh, and Hog. Hog, if you're listening, I, 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 you too. Everyone that has been a constant part of my life for this past year, I am grateful for each one of you. I love being able to talk to you guys on a regular basis, some of you every day. Ice, I absolutely love working with you when we do over the course of the year. Um, it It is you guys help me be even better. And I hope that I do the same for you. I hope that uh, our friendship and our quote-unquote working relationship, because let's be honest, what we do isn't necessarily work, um, is beneficial for, just as beneficial for you guys as it is for me. I enjoy your company, and I am eager to see where our little project goes next year. Green beans, potatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> I got beans and bologna. <laughs> Please come home. <laughs> oh, 
no, no, I don't have a minute to talk about your Lord and Savior. I'm sorry. I'm far too busy. I'm doing hot girl shit. <laughs> Wood good, you ain't even got no nuts to talk. You ain't got no special character next to your name. It ain't like you're subbed. <laughs> Savor. <laughs> Savor Jesus Christ. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. <laughs> Yeah, where, where's your little sub icon, huh, Woodgood? You've been sitting here all night having to watch commercials, ain't you? I've been watching ads. Everyone point at Woodgood. Ugh, he watches ads. There are no free subs. Only Zool. I don't know why that one echoed. That was way too loud. Sub-a-dub-dub. -dub. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that'll do it. We are done for tonight and for the year of 2023. Typically, I would end you with the immortal words of the Iron Sheik, which would be good night and go fuck yourself. Um, but tonight, I, I want to end with this. If I cannot bring you comfort, then at least I bring you hope. Thank you for joining me. This has been the Cult of Odd for 2023, and I will see you all next year. Oh.